through the waters I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. In verse number three. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I give Egypt for thy ransom, and Ethiopia and Saba for thee. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We ask that you would touch feeble lips of clay, that they would speak as the oracles of God. Touch our understanding, open our minds, open our spirits, open our hearts, that we will receive your word. And encourage and challenge us, Father, because you are a great God. And you will stand with us in every situation, in every circumstance. You are there with us, and we can trust you. We can rely upon you, and you are going to be there for us. And so we thank you for all that you've done in the service thus far and what you will continue to do. To you be honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so the third installment is, uh, you are never alone. The, the, the sermon title is, You Are Never Alone in the Battle. That is the overall sermon title. The subtitle for today is, God Will Stand With Us During Our Times of Adversity. Several weeks ago, this was already prepared by the Lord. God will stand with us during our times of adversity. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, that's not in the notes, but... Uh, the, Alex could go to it. First Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 6. But let me back up and, and pick it up from verse number 1 coming down. David and his men went out and they were fighting. And when they came back to Ziglag, the Amalekites, uh, the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people, came to Ziglag. And you know what they did in Ziglag? They took all of the women the young people, the children, and all those who were not able to fight, they took them out and they took their cattle, they took their wealth and everything out of Ziklag. But David was not there. They also took David's two wives, Abigail and Ahinoam, the Jezreelite. And so they took all of these folk away. When David and his men came back in proximity of Ziklag, they saw smoke. Because the Amalekites set the city on fire to burn everything down. As far as they were concerned, these folk were not going to come back here and rebuild anything. That's how the devil operates. But God always has a plan to frustrate the purpose of the enemy. And when David came, some of his men did not fully understand the spiritual context of what was going on. And they said, David, you are responsible. And they wanted to stone David. And David said some very powerful words in verse number six. Let's, let's put up verse number six. I think verse number six as we go from. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, to mean that they were in a difficult situation, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places. Keep rolling on. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land, brother, we're reading the wrong scripture. First Samuel chapter 30. Just look again and realize something in tasting right in my mouth. First Samuel chapter 30. I can't wonder how I'm not getting verse 6. This is the right scripture right now. Alex is fired. <laughs> and David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Hallelujah. David had people who were taken. Abigail was extremely close to David. Ahinoam was also close to David. His two wives were taken, so his soul was in distress. But David chose to look beyond the distress and look to the God who has the power to ease the distress. And sometimes we allow the distress to overwhelm us and to shatter our confidence in God's ability to work. And sometimes it's just a test to see whether you're going to hold on to God. The song is, I'm holding on, regardless of the circumstances and the fight and the challenges and the difficulties. I am still holding on, the song that Juanita sang for us, that ignited an anointing and, re and, and released a passion and an unction in this congregation. Hallelujah. 
Glory be to God. And so David said, I am encouraging myself in the Lord. And sometimes as an individual, you need when everything around you seems to be collapsing around you and you don't have anybody you can call upon, you need to do like what David did. I had to do that myself. Encourage myself in the Lord. There are times you might not find anybody calling when you desperately need somebody to call and nobody is calling, but you can turn to the word of the Lord and encourage yourself in the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell your brother next to you, encourage yourself in the Lord. Your brother or your sister, encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Let's go to the, to the, to the sermon. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 12 says, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 12, uh, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The moment you made the decision to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, persecution became part of what you signed up for. It's part of what you signed up for. No matter how you try to avoid it, even in your own home, you could be persecuted by folk who don't understand what God is doing in your life. But when I became a Christian, when I gave my life to the Lord, I grew up in the church, but when I gave my life to Jesus, it is a different, there's a difference between giving your life to Jesus and being called a Christian. No, oh, let me try and make the distinction for you. There are folk like me who grew up in the church. I was not a Muslim or a Hindu, so I am regarded as a Christian, but I had no relationship with Jesus. And that's one of the things we've got to make sure that we, 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 we relate to our children. Amen. We relate to our children. They come with us to church, but that doesn't mean that they have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our responsibility is to make sure that we move them to the level that counts. Oh, you, you hearing me this morning? I'm getting warm. I'm getting warm. Because they'll be here with you. They come with you. But the question is, the question that we would ask, are these children in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Every Sunday. My children had no choice. They had to come to church because when they were born, I was already pastoring long before they were born. I was pastoring as a single man. And so when I got married, I got married while I was pastoring. And so when they came, they, they were born into the pastorate. So that was life all the time. But I never gave them a hard time or, or set impossible standards for them. I wanted them to be children. I wanted them to be normal children. Because if you allow them to be normal children, it becomes easy for them to give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ because they look at you and think that you're not impossible. Oh, yeah, I lost some of you here. <laughs> that you're not impossible. I remember one day myself and an older sister in the church got into a little fight, not physical, but in a little, you know, exchange. She was of a generation before my generation. And so she did not understand the changes that we were going through in the modern generation. Now, Juanita was three years old, and she was riding with me to some place, and a three-year-old girl, and we, her mother and I made sure that she wore a, a pants. And that was a problem. <laughs> and Miss Juanita sat on a step... And she said, like our boy would sit, legs wide open. And my word, this senior sister in the Lord went off like, it, like an express train. And I said, it is a little child. She's three years old. She don't even know what she's doing. What are you trying to sow into the mind of my child? I had to, 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 to nip that in the bud very early. Because sometimes we create these impossible expectations for our children. And when they don't meet up to those expectations we frown and we fuss and we blame everybody but you set an impossible standard for them and be, they reject that impossible standard and my encouragement to parents uh, set realistic standards for your children and always remember that they are going to make mistakes and you ought to be mature enough to correct them and to help them not with arrogance but in a spirit of humility and in a spirit of love Oh, you don't hear me yet. Let me leave that maybe for some other time. Deal with family and, and that kind of story. Deal with family and that kind of stuff. But 
all those who will live godly in Christ, uh, Jesus, not may suffer persecution, the scripture says, uh, shall suffer persecution. It is going to come at some point in your life. And God will give you the grace and the strength to take care of it. Because if God doesn't give us the strength and the grace, we will crumble under the persecution. We will crumble under the weight of the persecution. But thank God for his all-sufficient grace that is able to abound to you and me in adverse situations and in adversity. For he is a faithful God. He cannot lie. One of the comforting things about our wonderful and caring Lord is the fact that he will be with us in the fire. And in our most challenging moments, he is going to be with us. So one of the most, uh, one of the comforting things about our wonderful and caring Lord is the fact that he will be with us in the fire and in our most challenging moments. He's not going to abandon us. He's going to be there with us. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse number 7. Deuteronomy 28 verse number 7. Look at this verse. And you've been quoting in prayer and in other things. The Lord shall cause thine enemy. The Lord, not anybody else, but the Lord shall cause thine enemy. Thine enemies, more than one, thine enemies. Because the folk who, when they see God doing stuff in your life, they suddenly start hating you for no reason whatsoever. You have not done them anything. You have not taken anything from them. But they can't stand the fact that they ridicule you. They put you down a long time ago and declare over your life that you would amount to nothing. But now they're seeing God blessing you, and they can't handle God blessing you. And so what they do, they get nasty and vicious and bitter and conniving and try to mess with you but the devil is still a liar God still sits on the throne hallelujah he still sits on the throne they didn't know they have no understanding they cannot even relate to some of the days when you were struggling when you were crying your pillow soaked with tears and you felt a sense of rejection and a sense of abandonment then one day God came through and broke through for you and caused you to move from a place of abandonment and a place of frustration to a place of blessing they only see the movie at the end but they didn't know how the movie started they came in later saw the titles at the end and then started to believe that that is where you were no 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 no. the movie started a long time ago when you were struggling you had no food you had no clothes you wore other people's clothes you wore other people's shoes but then God brought you out of that situation and blessed you with your own are you hearing me this morning saints hallelujah hallelujah so don't be worried about people who, who criticize you and, and condemn you and write you off. If God has not written you off, you got a long way yet to go, a long way yet to go, a long way yet to go. It is over when God says it is over. And if God says it is not over, it is not over. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten to be smitten, to be killed before thy face. You will see them. You will see them. You will hear about them. You will read about them. That God has taken care of sudden death. Uh, sudden death. Then you will hear that, that, that things are happening in their lives that they, can't, that they can't find any cure for their sickness and disease uh, because they mess with, with, with you. They mess with the people of God. The Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. Uh, they shall come out against thee one way. And flee before thee in seven ways. Because God places an anointing upon his people that would terrify the ungodly. He will place an anointing upon you that would terrify the ungodly and cause them not to be able to mess with you. At your workplace, there are people who are trying to sabotage your work, sabotage you to get you fired. But when they see you, they can't do anything about it. And every time they see you, they got to respect you because there is an anointing that God has placed upon you to preserve the job that he has given to you. They didn't give you the job. God gave it to you. And the devil can't take it from you because you are a child of God. And because you're a child of God, he will protect you and surround you with power and his anointing. Hallelujah. Don't concern yourself with haters. Leave them alone. Oh, let me say it again. That's a modern people word. Don't concern yourself over haters. Leave them alone. They will continue to hate. Bitter people cannot show appreciation. 
Oh, let me. <laughs> Bitter people cannot show appreciation. They can't show it. They can't express it because they're bitter. And when they're bitter, they're toxic. And not only toxic, they're corrosive. And you've got, to be, you've got to be wary of bitter, toxic, and corrosive people because they'll mess with you. You don't put your hand in a bottle of, of sulfuric acid. You put your hand in a bottle of sulfuric acid, you're going to be boiling all the time, and your hands will never be the same that it used to be. A toxic person is like sulfuric acid. Oh, you ain't hearing me this morning. A toxic person is like sulfuric acid. God said they'll run from before you in seven di di direction. And for our working people, I normally tell you that you did not go to the workplace to make friends. You went there to give professional service of money. Amen. Oh, let me say it again. Because sometimes you get mixed up and get the whole thing convoluted. Because you think that you got to go make friends with people who don't care anything about you. And the moment you, the moment you connect with them, the enemy try to mess with you. You're there to give professional service for money. That's the only place you go out and give professional service for money, your place of employment. You come to church, the environment is totally different. We come here because we love Jesus. We give because we love Jesus. It's not about being professional or anything in the house or in the presence of the Lord, but at your workplace, it is not your assignment to go there and make friends with people who are talking about you. When they see you, when you march in the place, they stop talking. But when you are not there, they're talking about you like a junkyard dog. You need to understand that God didn't send you to that place to make friends with people. Of course, you ought to be decent. You ought to be nice. I am not telling you to be, to be, to, to, to be rude and to be hostile to anybody, but you've got to be very careful because the enemy is extremely subtle. There are times he comes as an angel of light that, and you can't see him. And there are times you can recognize him from a distance. But the times when he shows up as an angel of light, he's behaving like he's got your best interests at heart. And that is when he's most dangerous. That is when he's most lethal because you're, not, you're, you're dropping your guard. You're not, you're not really expecting anything to happen. That is a moment you need to really keep your guard up because the enemy is about to strike like a cobra. When you are in a covenant relationship with Jesus, he stands with you in the darkest hours of your life. That's very important. When you are in covenant relationship with Jesus, he stands with you in the darkest hours of your life. It doesn't matter what you're going through. If you are in covenant with Jesus, he is going to stand with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why you can go through the fire because he's standing with you. The person going through the fire is in covenant with the Lord. And because he's in covenant with the Lord, God is responding to him saying that this fire is not going to harm you or going to hurt you. You just look at this fire. I have made you fireproof. I have made you fireproof. I have given you asbestos clothing that this fire and this heat can't really mess with you. I have prepared you for this season so that you are going to succeed in every situation and in every challenge that the enemy brings along your pathway. Are you still here this morning? So when you're in covenant relationship with Jesus, he stands with you in the darkest hours of your life. In the darkest hours of your life. It is not if you will go through the fire. It is when you go through the fire. Because sometimes you are going to go through the fire. And so at some point in your life, fire or trouble will come to you as a child of God. What is so encouraging is that God would not abandon us in the fire. He will not abandon us. He would not abandon us in the fire. God will stand with us in the midst of the fire, regardless of the intensity or the magnitude. Oh, this is significant, my brothers and sisters. That God will stand with us. He will stand with us in the midst of the fire, regardless of the intensity, the heat, or the magnitude of the fire. God is going to stand with us, and God cannot lie. 
He stood with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He stood with Daniel. He stood with Joseph. He stood with Paul and Silas in the prison house. At midnight, they were singing praises unto God, praising God. And the Bible says the prison door was open. Peter was in jail, and Herod was preparing to kill him after the Sabbath. And prayer was made on his behalf. And God opened the door. The angel slapped him on the foot, and he wanted to know what was going on. The door opened, the chains fell off, uh, and Peter going through the door and suddenly realized uh, that this is a miracle. I am out of this place. Uh, he got to the house where they were praying, and a young girl named Rhoda came to the door and saw Peter, and she came back to them and said, Peter's at the door. And they said, you're crazy, young woman. Is his spirit, is his ghost. You're seeing a, a zombie at the door. Peter decided to, to to ram the door. Bam, bam, bam on the door. Then they came. When they saw Peter, they were astonished. How are you praying for God to answer a prayer? Then when God shows up, you are not prepared to receive what God has done. We've got to get to the place where we don't trust our training and our wisdom, but we trust our faith and our confidence in God's ability to work. Hallelujah. Go to Daniel chapter 3, verses 22 through 25. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace was exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men. You see how God took care of the enemy? These men decided they're going to take these guys to throw them into the fiery furnace. And the flames were so hot that it killed the men who tried to throw them in. And the Bible says... The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Please roll on. And, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the fiery furnace. They tied them up, tied them up, hands behind back, and their feet tied together. They couldn't do nothing for themselves. Their mouths were not tied. Their spirits were not tied. Oh, you're hearing me this morning. You could tie my feet. You could tie my hands. Once you can't tie my spirit and tie my mouth, I am going to get a breakthrough. Oh, you are hearing me this morning. Well, you could tie my hands. You tie my hands behind my back. You tie my feet up and you tie me up in such a way. But once you untie my mouth or tie my spirit, I am coming out of this situation. Because if God be for me, if God be for you, who can be against us? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was stunned and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. They were bound, thrown into the den, into the fiery furnace. And he says, Walking in the midst of the fire, a strange phenomenon that these men walking in the midst of the fire, and this has never happened before. God revealed to this heathen king, made an appearance and caused this heathen king to recognize who it was walking in there. Let me tell you something. You got folk who will say, I ain't going to believe God, no matter what you say. No, there is no God. There comes a time when God shows up and says, I am here. Let me hear what you got. Let me hear what you got. He said, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fort, of the fort is like, like the, the Son of God. God. He could not see the Son of God. He saw a form that, that, that said to him, this is uh, the Son of God. And he said, this thing, is, this, this, this thing is marvelous. They were sent for. They were taken out of the, the furnace. And a new decree was issued across the nation that in every tongue and language and province in this nation, you will serve the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He will stand with us in the midst of the fire during the tough times. He is going to stand with us. This word is true, my brothers and sisters. This word is true. God cannot lie. His word is true. And he will honor his word above his name. He will honor his word above his name. What hastens the Lord to respond to our cry or our predicament is our childlike faith in God's ability to work irrespective of the gravity of the situation. You have it on the screen. 
what hastens the Lord to respond to our cry or our predicament is our childlike faith in God's ability to work, irrespective of the gravity of the situation. And God knows that we face challenging circumstances and situations on a daily basis. Some of you at home, some of you at work, some of you on the road. Sister Morrison have one on the road on Meserat Road. But God says, I am going to respond to you in that situation. Hallelujah. I'm going to respond to you in that situation. Here is something that I want us to note, and I hope they, they have that in the PowerPoint. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Now faith, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I don't have any evidence of what I am believing God for. I have nothing in front of me that tells me that this thing is going to happen. But my faith says to me, if I believe God, if I stand on his word, regardless of the fact that I have no evidence, that God is going to bring to pass his word. That God is going to bring to pass his word. When the bank was asking us for all this information and you feel like they're pulling everything out of your system and you can't see no way out of it, God came true. I'm telling you, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Go to verse number two. By for it, by it, the elders obtained a good report. Remember, they did not have what we have today. And they were believing God based on what the prophet would say to them. And so the word says, for by it, meaning that they believe what they heard, and based on what they believe and their confidence in God's ability to work, they obtained a good report. They obtained a good report because their faith was tied to the word of God. And based on that, God came true for them. God came true for them. Verse number three, through faith. We understand, we understand that the worlds the were framed the by word the word of God. God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Because God spoke. God spoke and the world came into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And when God brought up the earth from the water, then God came down and got himself some dust, some mud, and he decided he would make a man out of this mud. Oh, glory be to God. I mean, we fix up the mud, but we're mud. <laughs> dust thou art. And to dust you're going back. And so God just stepped down and took what he created by his spoken word and formed man from the dust of the earth. Then he looked at the man and he said, buddy, you're lonely. You need somebody to keep your company. These dogs and these rats and these raccoons and these other animals cannot relate to you. And God decided to put him to sleep. And God took from his side a rib. That's why, that's where the woman ought to be, at the side of the man. The wife is at the side, not at the fist, not at the, y'all ain't with me, it's all right. <laughs> not at the foot, nor did God put her to the head, but at the side, at the side, at the side, that you take good care of her, amen. And so, by his spoken word, God did all of these things. There are two examples which are very compelling that we should emulate for our personal growth and spiritual development. The first one is found in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I'm not going to read all of that for you. Mark chapter, if we'll just give you the scripture, Mark chapter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The Bible says uh, there were four friends uh, who brought a paralytic man. Paralytic. He was paralyzed, paralysis. He can't move, can't do anything for himself. And that word paralytic comes from the Greek word paralyticos, which means helpless. That the man was helpless. Indeed he was. But these four men decided to help the paralytic out. Sometimes you got to help the spiritual paralytic out. I can get that next week. you probably get that next week. Leave the one alone. Sometimes you got to help the spiritual paralytic out. Because there's some folk, if you don't give them a push, they're not moving to the next level with, with God in their relationship. And sometimes you need to give them a little push and give them a little push. These four men 
came to the place where Jesus was ministering. The room was filled with people. They could not get in the room. The normal thing that they should have done was to say, body, we tried. We, we've, we, we've done the best we can. Look, man, you can't get in there. There's no way. There's no room. The man at the door is not allowing us to go in. So we can't. And it's four of us trying to take you in. Even if they want to let one in there, and they see four, they're not, they're not bothering with you. And the men decided that even though they saw an impossible situation, that they were not going to run, they were not going to surrender, they were not going to give up. And sometimes when we see impossible situations and circumstances before us, we either run or we either surrender or we give up and we lose the victory. These men decided we are going to use our head. If we can't get through the door, maybe, just maybe, we can get through the roof. We might not be able to get through the door. They might not allow you to squeeze through this area, but you got to look in some other area that you can squeeze through because you understand your purpose. You know what God has in store for you, and the enemy is trying to abort your purpose, and you can't allow him to abort your purpose. Therefore, you've got to do what it takes to get to where God wants you to be. Is this thing making sense to you? The one on the roof. It wasn't easy. When you are taking a paralytic, you're taking a man who dropped all his weight on you. Anybody ever, you ever been a pallbearer <laughs> in Jamaica, in Guyana, in Trinidad, in, in St. Vincent, in Sierra Leone, and in, in, in all the different, in Panama? Anybody in El Salvador, anybody ever been a pallbearer? When you pick up, I mean, here, you, they're sophisticated, they put it on that, 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 that trolley and you're rolling the person going out. But when you back home, they ain't got none of that kind of stuff and you got to physically pick up that, that, that casket, the casket by itself heavy, and the man inside is also heavy. you struggling to go, and you're telling the guys in front of you, man, you're making a move with this thing because you're under pressure, you're feeling it on your lower back. You know the weight of it. Imagine these men taking this man to the roof of the building. It was not a comfortable experience, but they took him to the roof and they started to remove the tiles on the roof and they cut a hole large enough and they had another challenge because now you got to find something to tie the four corners of what they had to let this man down so that he don't fall out of what they were letting him down in. It was not an easy assignment. And so they carefully decided they would let him down. When he came down, he landed in front of Jesus. When Jesus looked up and he saw what happened up in the roof, he decided that the faith of these men, the faith was so great that he had no other alternative but to heal the man. And all that Jesus said to the man, take up your mat and walk. Just get up and walk. Just get up and walk. Just activate yourself now and move God responds to childlike faith and aggressive faith and daring faith and challenging faith. Go to the second example. There was this Canaanite woman. She was not a Jew, so she was a Gentile. There are some commentators say that she was, she was black. The others commentators say that no, she came from the Canaanite generation. If she was a Cushite, then she would have been a black woman. Are you following me? If she was Cush, then she would have been a black woman. But she was not a Jew. She was a Gentile. And she came to Jesus, and she said, Jesus, can you help me? My daughter is demon-possessed. And Jesus looked at the woman and said, I am not sent to you, but to the Jews. The woman decided she is not going to, to, to argue with Jesus on the matter of who he came to. Then she started another conversation with Jesus. Jesus said, it is not right, the King James says, it is not meat for me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Now you've got to understand, in the Jewish culture, they saw the other nationalities as dogs. 
And so when Jesus was speaking to this woman, he was speaking from a Jewish perspective. Not that Jesus was despising or wanting to put this woman down. He was speaking from a Jewish perspective. And he was saying, from a Jewish perspective, you are regarded as a dog. And the woman was wise enough, spiritual enough, understanding enough to say to Jesus, but even the crumbs that fall from the table, the dogs under the table would eat the crumbs. And that caused Jesus to stop. And Jesus said to the woman, great is your faith. Your daughter is delivered. Your daughter is set free. Your daughter is delivered from this demon possession. And she was made whole because of of the fate of this Canaanite woman. We should not allow ungodly people to exercise more faith in our Christ than we can do. Oh, let me say it again. We should not allow ungodly folk to exercise more faith in our God more than we can exercise. We ought to be able to say that God is able to do it regardless of the circumstances and the situation around us because he is God. Here is where we got some problem. The problem many of us have is that we get our training, and I'm repeating this to you, we get our training and our senses involved when God is looking for our faith. Do we have that on the screen? So that the folk can get that. I want them to get it. I want them to get all of that. That is very powerful. And so it, the problem many of us have is that we get our training and our senses, our senses involved when God is looking for our faith. That is extremely profound. That God is looking for your faith, not your senses, but your faith, your faith. Because your senses will not cause God to work. But your faith in God's ability will cause him to work. Are you hearing me? The doctor might have said no to you that this thing can't happen, but your faith in God's ability would turn it around. The signal will always be green when your faith is in God's ability to work. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me, let me say it again because apparently they don't have it. The problem many of us have is that we get our training and our senses involved when God is looking for our faith. He's looking for our faith. He's looking for our faith. Not our senses, but our faith in his ability to work. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 10 through 17. 2 Chronicles 20, 10 through 17. Hallelujah. I hope that Juanita could to get it typed quickly so she can send it over to you. The problem many of us have is that we get our training and our senses involved when God is looking for our faith. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 10 through 17. Let's read. And, and now, behold, behold the, children the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade. God stopped Israel from invading these people's land when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and destroyed them not. They decide, look, we ain't going to deal with you because God said, don't touch you. Go to verse number. Behold, I say how they reward us. Even after they treated them nice, now they're trying to mess with them. Have you ever dealt with Marga Dog and Marga Dog turn wrong and bite you? Oh. Did the pastor say that? <laughs> no, the pastor didn't say anything like that. Did he? Did he say that? They say you treat Marga Dog nicer and then Marga Dog turn around and bite you. It is the same experience that they're experiencing here with these folk. Behold, Brother Bell explained to Sister Bell what we mean by Marga Dog, please. Sister Bell, let me explain it in, so that you can understand it. I, I, I apologize. I, I should not have used that Caribbean stuff that you don't understand yet. Here's what they, what they mean. That you treat people nice and they turn around and do you harm. Yes, that you treat them nice and they turn around and do you harm. And so here, we go back to the scripture. Will you come back to that some other time? Go back to the scriptures. Let me keep rolling. Behold how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. Now they're coming to get them out what God has blessed them with. 
It's not their place. So God has given the people possession, and they now get very angry and bitter and toxic and coming to say we can cast them out of what God has assigned to them. O oh, our God, will not thou judge them? For we have no might against this great company that come against us. Neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. This is where the victory starts to, to take shape. I can't look at the problem. I've got to look to God. Because if my eyes are upon God, he will see me through. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus said the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but the battle is God's battle. Tomorrow go ye out against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jericho. Ye shall not need. I like verse number 17. I like verse number 17. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation the Lord of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, 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 go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. You are going to experience victory because God is going to be with you. He will stand with us. God will stand with us during our times of adversity. Let me bring this to a conclusion. I wish I had three hours. <laughs> there are some very important things we need to do in order for God to stand with us during our times of adversity or during adversity. There are some very important things we need to do in order for God to stand with us during adversity. What's the first one? We must be in covenant with Jesus. We must be in covenant with Jesus. He's not obligated to be with you if you're not in covenant with him. But if you're in covenant with Jesus, he is going to be with you. Please go to 1 Samuel 2.30. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said, I said indeed, indeed that, that thy house, talking to Eli, that God had made a covenant with Eli, and they broke the covenant. And so God is reminding Eli of the covenant that he made with him. And thy house and thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. If I honor God, God will honor me. If I'm in covenant relationship with him and I honor him, God will honor me. But the sons of Eli dishonored God and God killed them. You didn't hear that? I said God killed them. Because of their attitude and, and the way they were treating God and the women who came to the house of God, raping the women who would come to the house of God to clean and to minister, they would sleep with them. And Eli heard it and did nothing about it. And God said, I am going to take care of this business. And God killed them. So number two. We must, we must have faith in the infinite ability of God. We must have faith in the infinite ability of God. Hebrews 11.6. But without faith... But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I must believe that God exists. I must believe that God is real. I must believe that God is here. I must believe that God is able. And the Bible says that God will take care of whatever my situation is. Number three. We must trust his word instead of our feelings. We must trust his word instead of our feelings. My brothers and sisters, I can tell you I've made that mistake many times uh, that I trust my feelings rather than trust God's word. Rather than trust the Lord, I let my feelings get in the way. And many of us allow our feelings to get in the way. You notice I'm not saying ladies, I'm saying many of us. 
I lost all of them, Brother Keith. I lost all of them just now. I lost all of them. I'm not, you notice I didn't say ladies. I said the problem we have is that we allow our feelings to get in the way. When we allow our feelings to get in the way, we run into all kinds of troubles. All kinds of troubles. I know the men trying to get me to, to go down a particular road, but I ain't taking the bait. I'm not taking the bait. I'm not taking the bait. I'm going on to sleep with my wife. I'm not taking the bait. <laughs> I'm not taking the bait. And I want to Paris to give him my elbow to the side. So I'm taking the bait. I'm not taking the bait. The bait looks nice, but I'm tempting, but I'm not biting. I'm not biting. Um, the, 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 this croaker not biting. This red snapper not biting. This, the, <laughs> this Banga Mary not biting. <laughs> and so we, we must trust his word instead of our feelings. Look at Luke chapter 5, verses 4. Through seven. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Simon launch, launch out into, into the deep, deep and let, and let down, down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, Master we have, we have toiled all night. His feelings get into the way now. Master, we have toiled all night and, and have taken nothing. nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, then closed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. Verse number seven. And they beckoned unto their partners which were on the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. The blessing was so much that the ship that they brought in started going down. Listen, if Simon had followed his feeling, we were out there all night. It was cold out there, the breeze, the wave. And now, Master, you're telling us to go back out. We are seasoned fishermen. You are not a fisherman, but you're telling us to go back out. But Simon had better sense. He said, if the Master is saying this thing, I better obey what the Master said. And he had what they caught in about an hour. They went all night and caught nothing. But in one hour, God filled both boats with fishes. Oh, God is a good God. The stuff that would take years to, to come to pass that God can get done in the twinkling of an eye. Number four. We must not be double-minded. We must not be double-minded if God is going to work with us in adversity. We cannot afford to be double-minded. Our minds got to be single. Our focus got to be single. So that God will work. We can't be like the waves in the sea, tossed to and fro. Today we trust in God, tomorrow we're not trusting God. Today we believe Him, tomorrow we're not believing Him. Today we're holding on to God, tomorrow we're not holding on to God. We can't be like that. We've got to be consistent with our faith in God's ability to work. James chapter 1 and verse number 1, 8. A double-minded double -minded man is what? Unstable. Is unstable in all, in all of his ways. The worst person for you to connect with and to get into a combat with is a double-minded man. You would find yourself in a foxhole all by yourself when bullets start flying and you're looking for him, he's not there. Because in the beginning, he don't want to go. He want to go and he don't want to go. He want to go and he don't want to go. You cannot build anything with a double-minded person. That would last because that person is not reliable. You need somebody who is reliable that when the chips are down, that person is still there. When the chips are up, that individual is still there. But a double-minded man, his first reaction is to run. Oh, you're hearing me this morning. His first reaction is to run, to quit, to give up, to surrender, and say, I enable with this. I enable with this. I am bargain for all of this. I ain't bargain for all of this. I won't get to you until the first Sunday in October with point number four. Because point, next Sunday we have a guest and then the following Sunday we have Dr. Blumenthal. But this food is percolating on the, on the fire. It's real percolating on the fire. Uh, it's seasoned. The Holy Ghost just seasoned this thing so nice. Uh, just seasoned it up so that when you eat it, that you could fight any demon that try to attack you, attack your home during the course of the week because he's given you the strength and the ability through his word because the entrance of his word gives light and his understanding. When we, when we connect with the word, it gives us a light and it creates understanding in our lives. So we 
have the capacity to fight the enemy and win. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus today. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Come on, give him a praise. Give him a shout of 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 praise. He's worthy of all glory. Worthy of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.